Hello everybody, welcome back to the Young Fan Podcast. The time has come for me to do my Oxford United season review and roundup. Quite a long form podcast episode today because we're going to be looking at the whole season, how it's gone, the ups, the downs, the roller coaster of emotions we've been on as an Oxford United fan this season. Um, so much to talk about. We're going to be looking, like I said, um, the results, the key points of this campaign. We're looking at the squad as well, looking at next season, looking at the manager, Carl Robinson. I'm going to be doing my awards as well. So much to get through and so much to be excited about. Please make sure you subscribe and leave a like on this episode of the podcast, both of which are free and easy. It's, you know, it's free to do both. Probably the only subscription it's free to do on YouTube. Make sure you make that red button grey if it isn't already. And also hit that notification bell as well so you never miss an episode of the podcast. You'll be notified when I go live and when I do a live, uh, sorry, a non-live, so a recorded podcast episode just like this as well. So much content coming your way with the Euros as well. We're going to be doing so much Euro 2020 content surrounding England and the whole competition. So this is going to be my sort of final Ox United content of the year really which is crazy we followed the campaign through live and recorded podcasts it's been great fun interacting with you as well as the fans i thought today in long form style we're going to sort of sum up and brush this season under the carpet but not in a not in a bad sense but you know just put it aside uh, and then sort of talk about it and then move on and then put all of our thoughts uh, and discuss today where we lie as a football club going into next season so much to discuss let's get straight into it so we're going to start off uh, with um, you know where where Oxford United started the season and, and how we started as well, um, which is you know which we can all say without going into too much detail. It wasn't fantastic, was it? It wasn't the lightning start that we hoped uh, it could have been, and, and when we thought would be you know is crucial and is important uh, when you start a season. It's starting quick, starting strong, uh, and being successful. If you are going to be successful, if you are going to have a good season, starting strong is important. Did we do that no we didn't we started very very poorly we lost to Lincoln we lost to Sunderland we lost some very very important games it wasn't an easy start to the season when you think about it the first game being Lincoln the second league game we had Watford in between the cup but the second league game was Sunderland Lincoln and Sunderland uh, two teams that finished in the playoffs played each other in the playoff semi-final um, in the first two games of our campaign it's not easy it's not really an ideal start in terms of the fixture lift licks fixture list but You've got to deal with it, haven't you? You've got to deal with it. And if you want to be competing with those teams, um, you know, beating them and, and playing them early on is always a good sort of representative. Uh, and, and sort of you can really see early on where your squad is, how it's shaping up. You know, was pre-season good? For Oxford United, it, it was. Are we ready for the campaign? We're playing two great sides. Were we ready I'm not quite sure. We look at it early on. I don't think we did. It was poor. It was sloppy against Lincoln, against Sunderland as well. There wasn't much improvement. And you could clearly see, and I, I'm actually recording this first bit, um, which is crazy. I'm actually filming this bit of the podcast um, first. And then I've, um, sorry, second. I've actually done the second half first because something happened with the first half in terms of the recording so I'm sort of I know what I've already said so I'm obviously not going to repeat that and then the second half is sort of looking at the squad looking at next season more and looking at the manager this this sort of half of the podcast is looking at the um the performances on the pitch, how it shaped up, uh, sort of as the season progressed. Uh, and I can tell you something: it was, you know, like I've already said, it, it was a difficult and, and disappointing start, you could say. And, and the first two games showed that, didn't it? We're going to look at the starting lineup first of all. If I quickly try and find that starting lineup for the first game of the season, um, let's try and find it. Losing two 0 there, drawing one one. That was a penalty. Here it is. So this is the lineup uh, for Oxford United's first game of the season against Lincoln. And I already said as well, the back line, other than Simon Eastwood, which is another interesting point. Simon Eastwood obviously lo losing that number one spot sort of in the first few games, well, first sort of five seven games of season uh, and then Simon East was starting in goal but ultimately that back line turned out to be our strongest uh, strongest back four Sam Long Elliot Moore Rob Atkinson Josh Ruffles Josh Ruffles went off injured but generally that back four was very very solid and, and, and the whole as the season went on that was our best four that was our best defense partnership with with the full backs and with the defenders and central central defenders uh, that that was our best defense that was our strongest um, strongest defensive line and, and we saw that so that's interesting to look at. In terms of that midfield as well, we saw Cameron Brannigan start the season with Liam Kelly and McGuane. We didn't see much of McGuane after he got injured, but what we did see was 
bits of quality. And before he got injured, he looked like he was only starting to get going, which again is interesting. By the way, we won't be going through every single lineup through the season. Don't worry, we won't be looking at every single game either. I just wanted to sort of compare this starting eleven with the one that we saw at the end and seeing that comparison as sort of, I guess, the, the, the teams and the starting 11s evolved as the campaign went on. Like I said, that midfield of Cameron Brannigan, Liam Kelly and Marcus McGuane in the end, some of those players were important, some of them didn't quite fit the bill. In that front three as well, Mark Sykes, Matty Taylor, James Henry, again, those players, again, proved to be very, very helpful, proved to be important. But for some reason, we started the season poorly, with the majority of that squad being a big part of that great run we went on in the mid-season, the part of that squad being very, very important in us finishing in the top six. Why did it not start strong? Why did it not look like it started very, very well? And what I'd say to that pretty much was uh, because key parts in that team weren't right. Simon Eastwood, he had a bad start to the season. He was not in the right frame of mind to start the campaign after losing that game against Wickham, being a big, you know, being a big part of that defeat. He wasn't in the right frame of mind. And a lot of the team progresses confidence. And confidence is a massive thing, but confidence breeds from the back. You've got a good goalkeeper that's happy with the ball, happy, confident, and you know, and, and, and safe, he, he, safe in himself. That whole that sense of confidence and, and comfort and, and the comfortable feeling will progress through the team. And without a comfortable goalkeeper, you'll see the, the less confident players uh, in front of him. Simon Eastwood was not comfortable early on. From the get-go, he wasn't. And that is disappointing uh, and very, very difficult. Again, that midfield, we'll talk about Liam Kelly as well. I mentioned it, I know I mentioned it in the second half of the pod, but Liam Kelly is another player where... I don't, I'm not quite sure where Liam Kelly stands. I know he's on loan. I don't think we're going to buy him permanently. And, and with Liam Kelly, I think technically he's a very good footballer. When we're looking at physicality, I don't think he's quite there yet. And what I mean by that, and yet, I don't know whether or not he will develop that because he can, I, I guess you can, and, and, but technicality is something that I think he's very, very strong at. Physicality is something that at the moment isn't quite there, I think is holding his game back, specifically in League One. We saw him in the Championship, we saw him in Holland playing for Feyenoord and for Reading in both of those leagues. We saw a very, very good, I'm not saying he's not good now, but a very, very good player. The moment I see a good player, in those two teams I see a great player. And that's the difference. The reason they think it's holding Liam Kenny back is that physicality, is that part side of the game where you get stuck in, you show a bit of aggression. I know he tries to get stuck in. I'm not saying he doesn't work hard for the team, but getting stuck in, you know, tackling, breaking the play up in that midfield, that's what's important. For me, Liam Kelly, I think when you compare the other teams and the top teams in this league, you compare their midfield to ours, our midfield, you could say in the nicest possible way, it's not a nice way of saying it, but it's the only way, was a bit weak. And in this league, you need players that are, you know, willing to, to just be so physical and get so involved in this game and, you know, and, you, and games will be won and lost in midfield it's so so rare if you don't win a match it's because your midfield battle was lost if you win the midfield battle you will most likely more times than not win the game Unless, obviously, you're playing direct, long ball, missing that midfield out. But even in that sense as well, that midfield needs to be winning those battles because the opposition will be trying to overrun your midfield. With Liam Kelly, more times than not, you can see them using their physicality to their advantage and definitely posing a threat against us, which is a, which is a key point and something that's going to be very, very difficult uh, for, for Liam Kelly to develop because, again, he, what is he, 25, 26 as a player? Um, you know, so, so is that going to develop? He's 25, yeah. So he's sort of in the peak of of his career, if you like, uh, and will that develop? He's generally quite a small lad. I'm not saying that small players can't be good at football. I'm quite a small lad. I'm not saying I'm great at football by any stretch, but I still get involved. I still get in. I still does that. But physicality would always hold us back. So that's something that needs to be looked at. I think something that, that Carpenter will look at. And by signing Marcus McGuane permanently, I think we will see the fact that you know he's a very very good player. He's a spark. Again, he's strong. He's powerful, and that's more the route we need to go down. I think this summer uh, is that physicality, and we saw that in that midfield in the opening day of the season. A decent cup game against Watford, 1-1. Rob Hall, the standout there. We lost on penalties. Um, I think we missed all three penalties. Yeah, we missed, we missed all three penalties. They scored all three. So their goalkeeper was complete and utter fantastic form. 
Then the next game of the season, we uh, we lose to Sunderland in a sloppy performance. Carl Robinson changes the formation. It was bad. It was very, very poor. It didn't show what we're good at in any stretch of the imagination. We didn't get a reaction from that opening day struggle. I remember coming on the podcast. It wasn't live back then. They were pre-recorded ones. And I said, we need to get a reaction after Lincoln against Sunderland. It's a difficult game to get a reaction from, but we needed to try and do it. We couldn't do it. We changed formation. I think for the first time in, in Carl Robinson's Oxford United manager career, he played with two up front. It didn't work. It flopped miserably and Sunderland showed their quality, pounced on it, and we got beaten 2-0. For Accrington, the game after, again, I'm not going to go through every single game, but I'm going to go through these first three because they were very significant. Accrington was the first winning game, and we saw in that team... Um, Sam Long starting back at left back, Sean Clare being at right back. We knew that wasn't going to work out quite early on. Sean Clare's a right back, he's a quality player. We saw how good he was out loan on Burton when we let him go in January. That quality he has in midfield compared to a right back, he's a different player because he's a powerful, very strong, and also very, very good footballer. At right back, you don't see the quality. He's definitely not as good as he is in that midfield by any stretch. And you can see early on, when we were playing Sam Long at left back, we were playing Sean Clare at right back, that back line generally was weakened. However, we look at the, the we look at Sunderland, um, we were very, very poor uh, going forward against Sunderland. In this game, we were pretty good defensively and very good going forward. We saw Rob Hall, Matty Taylor, Dan Adji being the front three. Certainly not the front three. We saw a lot of, um, a lot more, especially that combination. I don't think we saw it ever again. Uh, but generally, he started Rob Hall, mainly because of his great Watford performance. He started that. Didn't have a bad game at all. But again, that midfield is so strange with Henry, Kelly, Anthony Ford. It somehow worked against that Grinton. But again, it wasn't good enough because in the next game after Accrington, we needed to get take the momentum from that into the next game. We lose the game against Gillingham 3-1. We then lose the game to Peterborough 2-0. We do then beat MK Dons just 3-2. Which Shadipo comes in on, on deadline day and scores a goal against MK Dons. A great, great debut for him. Gets the three points. But then again, Charlton losing the game 2-0. Fleetwood losing that game 2-0. We were beaten, battered and bruised. That was the name of the start against Fleetwood. And the consistency there was awful. We were losing so many games. We were dragging our tails down the league table. We're in the relegation zone for three months. That Those performances there, ultimately that's such bad start. Carl Robinson not knowing his best 11. Carl Robinson not really getting to grips of what he knows is his starting 11. We can see the tinkers here and there. Injuries, of course, don't help. But generally, it wasn't quite there yet. You can clearly see the, the, you know, the, the, the issues we're getting from that. We do beat Rochdale 3-1. It was a good performance. That's more like it. I remember that being the same. Elliot Moore scoring a goal you know, to win that game. I think he scored, he scored two in that game. Yes, he did. Um, that's where the joke came from. Um, Peterborough as well. Losing in the FA Cup. No cut run this year for Rockers United. We'll mention that as well. Not having a very, very good cut run in either one. Losing the first round against Watford. Losing in the first round against Peterborough. Not easy draws, to be fair, by any stretch. However, we showed a bit of quality. We showed a much better performance against Peterborough. We got a reaction. We saw you know glimpses of, of hope and joy. And then, against Crewe. And remember as well, we will, we will talk briefly about the COVID cancellation at the start of the season. Do I think that was a big factor? Maybe we look at the momentum. We couldn't really get we couldn't get something going. It doesn't. It feels like another season. It does. It feels like another season when Oxford United couldn't get a run going because of games being called off for COVID. Um, you know, we got so unlucky with the amount of games being played. We were so behind. We had so many games in hand, and we couldn't take momentum from one game into another. I'm not blaming COVID. Obviously, that's more important. Obviously, that you know, lives and, and, and the safety and the health of others is far more important than Oxford United not playing games of football. I completely, completely understand that. However, in a footballing sense, that didn't help us. That did hold us back. We were playing catch up. We couldn't get momentum. We lost to Crew. Crew was an awful game. Crew was up there with one of the worst performances I've seen in Oxford United shirt. And I remember sitting there, coming on here after Crew and doing a podcast. And I remember sitting there and going, "Are we general?" relegation candidates because we are playing like a relegated team we're playing like a team that does not look good enough to stay in this league and I remember saying that and sitting here and, and having to sort of, I, I turned the camera off I sat down I went am I really sitting there and thinking this am I really doing that because look where we were last season look at the fall off this season and it didn't really get much better a good result against against Wigan 2-1 just though we scraped past them and then a really really good uh, draw you could say uh, against Hull City 1-1 uh, that was a very very good result we beat Ipswich in between that as well 0-0 um, not much going on in that game but again against Hull drawing 1-1 that was a good result it was that confidence that boost that we needed and then a draw against Portsmouth as well. Another really, really good draw. And then Swindon. 
in between all of that, I didn't do that in the same order for a reason, because you can see either side of this horrific result, we had some decent results. Portsmouth 1-1, one, 1-1 one, one, one hole. But in the middle of all of that, the biggest, biggest downer of our season was, of course, losing to Swindon Town. That was game was absolutely a river. We cannot move past this season review without talking about that Swindon game in too much detail. Because I won't, I won't, we can go back and watch it because it's probably one of the most viewed podcast ever I think I've ever done. And I won't go into too much detail, but we'll certainly touch on it because we have to, simply. Against Swindon, we were absolutely woeful. We were woeful. We started the game okay. We started the game dominating. We scored first. Matty Taylor scored in the first 15 minutes. We were going places. We were, we were, we were generally looking like a good side. At half time, we were winning the game. But you can see here, and I'm looking at the, the events that happened in the game on the screen. We were just playing this sort of grinding out panic game of football. We were playing like relegation candidates. Oh my gosh, we've scored a goal. Now let's sit back. Let's sit back. Let's time waste. We got three yellow cards in 10 minutes through time wasting. Sykes, Eastwood, Shadipo. Eastwood, by the way, was still in goal at this point. Um, he That was his first game, last game as number one uh, because of the mistakes he made uh, in the last two goals that ended up losing us that game. But generally, time wasting against Swindon you know, we were, were dragging and grinding a game out where we should have just gone for it. We were going deeper and deeper and deeper. Our back line was practically in the car park by, by the end of the game. We were so bad. They were, you know, they were playing a direct game of football, hum, you know, just, just thumping the ball forward. And we were just sat there and we didn't know what to do. We stood there and we did not know how to deal with this tactical change. Carl Robinson was, you know, try to get us to push out, try to get us to push out. Sunday league stuff. You get out, you try and stop these players from, from staying on side. They thump this direct ball into the box. We can see two goals. Absolute uproar. It looks like Oxford United, you know, are in probably the darkest and, and worrying place that they've ever been in. Uh, probably out of all the times in the last few years. But for Oxford United this season, that was definitely the lowest moment. And like I said, a reaction with Ipswich and Hull when those last two games were helpful. We then needed to get a run going. We needed to get a run going. Drawing to Blackpool once again, that's three draws in a row against three good sides, but it's no points, it's just draws. But I'm not saying that's not bad, I think that is pretty good. Then a thumping result against Northampton. Then another cancelled game against Bristol, no momentum there. However, 2-0 against Wimbledon, 3-2 against Plymouth, 5-1 sorry against Burton. Massive games, massive wins, three points, nine points in the, next, in the last three games, that's huge. We then take that momentum into Doncaster being cancelled, try and get that into Shrewsbury, that's cancelled. We then beat Cambridge in the cup. We then probably try and play Northampton. That's cancelled. You know what I mean? That, that was the position that we were in. We, we couldn't get momentum going. And then we finally did. Because then, three, uh, sorry, 2-0 two no against, uh, no against Bristol. 4-3 against Rochdale last minute at Mideshire Depot. 1-0 against Fleetwood. We never beat Fleetwood. Fantastic. Beating Wimbledon 3-1 in the cup. Then we lost to Doncaster. The run came to an end. It was a fantastic run. But even those cancelled games, you look back and you think, we actually we got an amazing run going, even with things stopping and starting. And that, again, when we're doing this season roundup and review, that's how impressive we were. We then will look at Doncaster 3-2. It was the first game we saw Brandon Barker come in on loan uh, with Elliot Lee. They both actually started the game. A front three of Elliot Lee, Matty Taylor, Brandon Barker. There was excitement. Um, you know, there was excitement in that team. And we'll mention, we'll mention Alex Gorin because we haven't mentioned him yet. He was probably... Early in the season, the best player. He was up there with my best and favourite player at the start of the season. He was so important. I think since he got that injury, didn't really get, you know, didn't, and then Cameron Brannigan sort of played his deep line role, which I'm not saying is bad. I thought he was very, very good at that, obviously. But I would say with, with Alex Gorin is he was so important at the start of the season. And I really hope that people don't forget how important and how good he was at breaking up the play. Last season was fantastic at it. This season, he was also really, really good at it. And at the start of the season, he was he, he was better at it. We didn't really see him too much in the second half of the season because we knew we had to play this consistent eleven, which did see Goring not in that. But I really, really thoroughly loved watching Goring play football at the start of the season. He's not the tidiest of players. He's not the clean, you know, not the most clean uh, footballing. You know, genius if you like, but he's a very, very good footballer. And he's good at what he does. You have to play to your strengths in this game. And Goran is very, very good. He can also be a little bit reckless at times, but generally breaking up the play, a great challenge in there. You know, stopping the opposition. You know, stopping that midfield, stopping that transition in midfield, breaking the play up so that you know they don't you know go go through that um you know go through the, the midfield, almost build like a dam in that midfield to stop the flow of, of the opposition going through you. Alex Goran is so good at that, and I really hope 
spoke with Alex Gorin, that we don't see that being forgotten, because I think we naturally do. I've you know, fallen in the trap of sort of forgot Alex Gorin, how important he was, but looking back when I'm doing this, I'm seeing how good he was. We did lose to Doncaster, though Jack Stevens didn't have a great game there. However, we then beat Bristol. We came back, and that was the first time really this season we've lost the game. We've shown a big reaction, losing to Doncaster, going on a great run, then losing. It's definitely a low point, not as low as Swindon, but definitely a point where you go, great run, it's come to an end, it's such a shame. We need to bounce back as quickly as possible. We do against Bristol. We then do against Wigan 2-1. Um, we then lose to Tranmere in the cut, which is horrific, a chance to go to Wembley, bold. We then draw to Ipswich as well, which is a decent result, but then Portsmouth away, sorry, Portsmouth at home, Losing that game 1-0 was hard to take. It was hard to take because we didn't, we, you know, we, we fought, I think we were on the top of the world in you know, that nine-game winning run. And I remember just sort of falling back down to reality. A little bit of a reality check against Ports is probably the best way of putting it. We weren't great, let's put it that way. MK Dons 1-1, Peterborough 0-0, Charlton 0-0, draws galore, you could say. Against MK Dons there, we scored in the 90 plus 7th minute, Elliot Lee. Uh, but, you know, it was draws everywhere. And, and then we needed to find some consistency if we were to sort of dream about the top six. At this point as well, we went from relegation candidates to top six hopers, which is crazy to think. But we got us having that position. That's what we wanted to get to. It's what we were even thinking about. Let's try and find some consistency. We then saw, some, we then saw Swindon. Uh, we then had to travel to Swindon. Swindon, we got revenge on them by beating them 2-1, so that's a laugh. Then Hull as well, we did lose to them 2-0, but against them, you can sort of understand it. Hull are a great side, they showed their quality, they showed their ruthless, clinical, and, you know, championship edge, that you could see the difference between us and them. They were very, very good. We then beat Doncaster 3-0 in one of the best games I think we saw like this season. We played to their strengths, we played um, to our strengths, sorry, but then also, you know, you know, pounced on the mistakes they were making. They kept in this playing out from the back, um stuff that they didn't work they tried to pass it out they tried to be you know start the attacks from the from the back but they couldn't get out they couldn't do it they kept giving us opportunities we made them pay we won the game three nil i remember doing my nick harris uh, interview if you haven't watched that please do check that out it was a great one uh, and we were talking about you know how we were so good against don cross on the tuesday and then how poor we were against blackpool losing that game two nil and then how poor we were again going into northampton we then did beat lincoln but then we were poor again against sunderland and you could see the inconsistency sort of come back into play which was such a such a shame we knew then we needed to win pretty much our next nine ten games and we probably only could afford to about lose one or two we actually got away with losing three we lost to Axton Stanley it felt like season over it felt like that was it it felt like that was the end of our campaign we then beat Crew 6-0 out of nowhere it was unbelievable you didn't see it coming it was fantastic 4-1 against Rosebury Town as well that was an absolutely fantastic result then Ginningham scoring 2-0 down Sam Long scoring a goal in the 90 plus third fourth minute or so to win the game there those three points being clutched up so important from one point to three points that's the difference that's made Sam Long coming in with a fantastic fantastic uh, last minute goal resilience we showed there was impeccable then against Wimbledon 2-1 red card losing the game that was a really really down moment and that then felt like we needed a bit of a miracle we needed not a football not an ultimate miracle a bit of a football miracle you know there's a difference we lost the game 2-1 against Wimbledon. We needed to pretty much win every game since then, and we did just that. We beat Plymouth 3-1, and we needed results to go away as well, which in the end came in handy. Atkinson came in clutch, beating uh, beating Pompey on the final day, and then also drawing to Portsmouth, drawing to Charlton. They helped us out. Atkinson and Stanley were our secret. They went from losing to beating us 2-1 to being our ultimate, uh, you know, our, our ultimate downfall. So in the end being our ultimate heroes, you could say. Beating Plymouth 3-1, three, uh, three uh, sorry. Then another last-minute, last-gasp winner with Dan Adji against Shrewsbury Town. Not as last-minute as Sam Long, but certainly from 2-1 down to show the resilience, to show the comeback we needed uh, in the end, which won the 85th minute, Dan Adji to win that game. Then Burton on the final day of the season, to be honest, we were focusing more on that Portsmouth-Accrington game. We did win that, four, that game 4-0. Fantastic stuff. And that is the season pretty much in a nutshell ups and downs, inconsistencies here and there. And I would say as well, inconsistency has been a big part of that. What I would say as well, looking at it from a manager perspective, because we will look at the manager now as well. I do mention it in the second, po the second half of the podcast, but 
we, you could see a little bit as the season had sort of ridden and, and, and rise, you could say. You could see the the inexperiences that Carl Robinson's still got as a manager. He is a young manager. He's fairly young for a, for, for a, well, you know, he's very young for a manager. And he's still, you know, a, a young a young man. He's, you know, he's still learning his trade. He's still learning the game. He's still learning the managerial job, if you like. Even though he's been managed three other teams, he still is learning what is needs to be done. And you can see the inconsistencies there. I know in the second half we do talk about um, the, the sort of, do I think he's the right man for the job? Do you think he's the right man for the job? Do you think that Carl Robinson is someone that can take us to the next level? Two full seasons, two playoff defeats. Is that a time to maybe move him on? For me, no, I don't. I think I, I don't think you should be doing that. If any other manager, I don't think he will. I think some people do have a bit of a gen, agenda against Carl Robinson. I don't think that's that's fair. I know at times he can be a very frustrating coach, and at times he can be a very frustrating person. But at the same time, as well, you know, these are managers. You know, we're not we're not looking at it from a human point of view. He's a love. I met he's a lovely bloke. But from a, we, you know, we are judging them off their off, off their trade, or off their job, off their profession at football. And he, he's as a football coach. There is a bit of him that I do think could be, you know, signs of not quite being there yet. But you've got to give him time. You've got to give him that back in. He's only been given two years, two and a half years. Give him a bit more time. Let him grow. Let him develop some of these players. And I'd be intrigued to see, uh, you know, where he goes as a manager, where he goes with Oxford United. Like I said, he signed a massive contract at the start of the season that meant that pretty much sacking him was going to cost us our transfer budget for the next four years. So we couldn't really let him go signing a four or five year contract or whatever it was silly was. Uh, was it silly? I don't know. I think four or five years is a little bit over the top. I think a three year, two year contract extension would have been better uh, for, 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 the, for the club. I understand for him, he wants security in his life. I get that. I still think three years would have been okay. I think four or five is a little bit over the top, but there we go. We move on from that. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, he has proved to be a good manager. He has got good players. He's a very good man manager. He's a very, very good motivator. So I think tactically, he does still show slight inexperience. Like I said, he's a young coach. He's still learning. And I, I do like Carl Robinson. I'm a Carl Robinson fan. I really, really am. I like the way that he, that he sets up his teams. I like the way that we play our game. I like that we play our football. So I think the recruitment's been up to scratch. Not brilliant. It hasn't been brilliant. It's been decent. It hasn't been brilliant. I think there's a lot of players that he's brought in that haven't quite been good enough and, and we've seen move on quite quickly. I understand that. I get that. But, you know, that's with a lot of managers. That's with a lot of things that, you know, people do get things wrong. And like I said, it's only his third professional job, uh, you know, as first kids, first team coach. It's important to know that, you know, he's going to learn. He is going to have to develop as a manager as well as developing players as well. So that is something you've got to take into consideration. Hopefully, that's something that you can take into consideration when letting me know in the comments down below. Do you think he's the right man for the job? I've been trying to say what you think. And also, in the comments, give me your thoughts uh, on the... Um on the coach situation generally, do you think he's a good, good manager? Give, 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 your, give your thoughts on, on the season as well, because again, I'm intrigued to see what you think. Uh, we are now going to go into the second part of this podcast episode. It's already been recorded. So, yeah, still to come, really. We've got, um, you know, player uh, player awards, player ratings, if you like, for the end of the season. We've also got um, sort of me looking at the squad going into next season, the retain list, players that we've released who I think we may let go, uh, contract situations, Josh Ruffles, my thoughts on that contract situation. So yeah, it is another day, but we're coming back to film this one uh, today. But as I was saying, the goals with Dan Aji and with Sam Long, they're the goals that, that separate you from getting a point, from getting you, you know, uh, and then getting you three points and ultimately then finishing in the top six. And without those points, it's very, very clear to see by just looking at the league table. In the end, we only did it by goal difference and, and Charlton won on the final day. Without those points and without those, you know, two extra points and four if you count both of those two, we wouldn't have been in the top six. We wouldn't have even had the opportunity to think about the playoffs. The playoffs didn't go the way that we wanted to go, obviously. But we knew that those eight goals were going to be the goals that, that ultimately got us in the position where we could even think about uh, finishing in the top six. Uh, and in the end, did. So... For us, you know, it was one of those where we were pushing for so long to get there. And I think when we got there, it was almost a little bit of a a shock, a bit of a surprise. And and we sort of got there and we're a little bit like, um, you know, deers in the headlights or whatever the saying is. I don't know. I think it is that where you sort of just, you're a bit struck. You're a little bit like, you know, starstruck, if you like. And you're sort of like, oh my God, we're here. And then we don't really take full advantage of actually getting there. And that's the frustrating thing. And it happened so far, so many times this season when it was, Here's an opportunity. Let's go and beat Doncaster 3-0. There's an opportunity to get there and then let's not perform against Blackpool. You know, 
and it was it was exactly the same with, with Blackpool in the playoffs. Really, let's 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 push ourselves so far. Let's go on that amazing unbeaten run. You know, we were a little bit inconsistent come the end of the season. Certainly not as bad as we were at the start, but. Here it is. Here's the opportunity. Let's take it. Let's take it. In the end, we do take that opportunity to finish in the, to finish in the playoffs. And then we draw Blackpool, obviously. And then we just don't really take full advantage of it. Ultimately, that tie was finished in the first um, in the first leg on the Tuesday. Um, that was when we lost the tie. Losing 3-0 at home, you simply cannot do that. You simply cannot lose 3-0 at home, um, you know, with it, especially with some fans uh, in, in the playoffs. Because to come back from a 3-0 deficit, no one's ever done it before. It would have been a, it would have been a record uh, and it would have, we would have made history in that sense. But, you know, when we got that early goal in Matty in the second leg, there was certainly some sort of like, I don't know, shock and, not shock, but, you know, a glimpse of hope, glimmer of hope, if you like. Um, and, 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 yeah, there certainly was a feeling of that. But at the same time, we didn't give ourselves the best opportunity, obviously. When you go into a second leg uh, with a deficit of 3-0, you've got to come back from, know that no other club's done it. You know, it proves if no other club's done it, then it's such a difficult test. We know it's a difficult test anyway, but how many times do you see it in a game uh, where you, when, you, when you're 3-0 down at half-time and you win the game 3-3 free, free, or win the game 4-3? You know, it, it's so unlikely. This is, you know, technically a little bit easier because you have got a whole game to do it in, instead of just a half, but... Still, you know, you're 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 putting yourself in a position that is so difficult to come back from that you have got to perform a miracle, and a miracle was needed in that second leg. Ultimately, it wasn't enough. We scored the three goals, but we considered the three as well. And again, we highlighted the defensive issues that I think we have got. I don't mean necessarily come from the individuals defensively, but maybe do come from other areas of the pitch. Also, as well, you have to remember we're going for it. We're leaving gaps at the back, so obviously we're going to be exposed in that second leg. Now, unintentionally, I have sort of dragged myself into the playoff conversation, and, and that's ultimately the season round up. It when we were looking at the league, we started very, very poorly. We went on a fantastic run, um, and then you know, and then we've had a bit of inconsistency come the end of the season. But ultimately, with the results going our way elsewhere, and us winning games at the last minute, and and you know, grinding out points in that sense, you know, not not, not one or two nils, but I'm talking close encounters between Shrewsbury, Gillingham as just an examples. Then some thumping wins against the likes of Shrewsbury and, and Crew, obviously winning six nil. Those results as well, sort of mixed with ones that we did sort of get away with it a little bit. All of those ultimately got us in to the playoffs. We then draw Blackpool, like I said, in the first leg. We, we were very, very sloppy. We were very, very poor. And you go back and watch the match reaction on that. I'm not going to do an individual debrief on both of those games because I've already done that. But um, ultimately, we lost the both, that whole tie. We lost the playoff semi-final on that first leg. We were sloppy. We didn't change the plan. And the reason why I bring this up again is because I think this is a little bit of the story of the season. I'm not going to lie to you. I think it is a little bit. I think Gar Robinson is a manager with experience. But not enough experience and you can clearly see that and that sounds a bit strange but it's true he's got experience in managing uh league one and championship clubs he's done that isn't it three three different clubs and he's got experience in that sense he's got experience in the playoffs however he hasn't quite got enough experience i don't think yet to be competing with the top top managers of this league and of, of the footballing um the footballing pyramid i don't think he has especially the english football building period especially the efl in particular i think efl is the best suited he's definitely not a premier league manager uh, by any stretch definitely definitely in the EFL. i think that's where he's holding him back a little bit as a manager he's sort of i'd say is, is stubbornness and i don't mean this in in, in, a, in, a, in a critical way i mean it, it is a little bit of a critical way but i don't mean that in a, in a horrible way because i think there's a lot of people that simply do not think carl robinson is the right man for the job and i'm not one of those people I'm not one of those people. I think you've got to give him time. You've given him two, if we're giving him two seasons, um, he's done well in those two years. He comes in uh, sort of mid-season under when when Pep Bricket was Pep Bricket was sacked. He came into that job. He came into that role. He saved us relegation. He sort of regrouped us a little bit. He then went into the first get first seat full first full season last year. And he did a very, very good job. He finished in the playoffs. He got to the final. We didn't take the opportunity in the final. Again, another opportunity of arguably bottling a, a bottling a chance um, of, of, of big improvement, of playing in a league above. And again, that's another sign of us not really taking full advantage of it. However, going back to Carl Robertson, he has got experience in the sense that he's managed League One Championship clubs. However, he hasn't quite got enough experience because he's a very, very young manager. You have to remember that. He is a young manager um, and he hasn't quite got that tactical, you could say, maybe tactical uh, experience just quite yet. Against Blackpool, you saw it. When we're losing 3-0, when you're losing 2-0, when you're being dominated, when well, but then 
we're not being dominant in the sense that we were that they had most of the ball. We had most of the ball. And dominant in the fact that they were clinical and ruthless on the counter attack, and they were dominant in, in everything they did when it comes to you know we're going to play the counter attacking game of football, and you're going to you know you're going to play into our hands. And we did play into Blackpool's hands. We did have the ball, but they were dominant in the sense that. They, they sort of dictated the way they wanted the game to go. They didn't dominate the ball, but they definitely dictated the way they wanted the game to go. They wanted to ultimately keep the ball, grind, try and break down this sort of, you know, very, very strong brick wall-like defence. And then what they needed then to do was hit her on the break and hit us on the counter. They wanted us to do that. They wanted us to play like that. And, and, and you know, and we played into their hands very, very well. And that's where Carl Robinson, yes, I think him being suspended four-game ban after what he did at Sunderland definitely didn't help him because he definitely didn't have the the actual vocal support of shouting from the touchline that you would normally see from Carl Robinson, obviously. And I think if we're losing 2 or 3-0, and probably for the whole game, you'd see Carl Robinson on the touchline shouting at his players, telling his players exactly what he wants. We had John Massinho and the Short Brothers doing it, obviously, and uh, the coaching, uh, the goalkeeping coach, Wayne Brown, as well. He was part of that, but... You know, it's not Carl Robinson. It's not the it's not the head coach. It's not the manager doing it. And and that maybe would have been uh, something that you know I think could have been interesting if if he was there. He wasn't. We can't look back on it. We can't live with regret in that sense. But it would have been interesting to see how that would have gone. Uh, say he did. Say he was there. But again, we can't go back and change that now. Um, but no, yeah. Going back to Carl Robinson, I sort of keep going on little tangents. But like I said, this is a long form long form podcast episode, so it's always going to be like that. But yeah, there is a sense of. Is Carbonson the right man for the job? Where do we go from here? And this summer, I think, is massive for him because if he finishes again, maybe not in the playoffs this time or scraping the playoffs, then not doing well in the, in the, in the playoffs uh, again next season. That's three years we've done the same. And, and where's the progress there can be argued. For us this season, I think because he went, he had such a horrible start, which needs to be improved, by the way, needs to be improved. We need to start stronger. We need to know, know our best 11 early on because I think we would have easily and comfortably finished in the playoffs even thought about automatic promotion, if we knew our best team early on, if we could start the season knowing our best 11, we can bring these players in, we can bring the Liam Kellys, the Derek Ossais, I know we didn't, you know, we didn't see him in the first half of the season at all, really, but the Liam Kellys, the the, um, the McGuane's, um, the, the Joel Coopers, we didn't see much of as well. I, I, I'm naming these players, and we didn't actually see them a lot. We didn't see them a lot, really. Um, you know, let's have a look at the arrivals this season in full. Uh, Matty Taylor on a free, Liam Kelly, the the Mide Shadipos. You know these players. Um, you know the, the you know these players. These are the ones where we could bring these players in, but you know where do we go with those players, and where do those players fit in what we want to try and do? They can do pre season, and that's what I want to see next season. Let's do our business early. We're not having to worry about you know players going and playing uh, in the Euros because not many are. There are some obviously, but not many. Why can't we go and do our business early? We know the positions where we need to strengthen. Let's get the business done. Let's get those deals done early. Let's get them in the preseason. I believe it's going to Spain or Portugal. I can't exactly remember, but I think it's you know between the, one of those one of those two different countries for our uh, for the training camp. Bring them in, settle them in, get them part of the squad, and then Carlson needs to know what his best eleven is because the first game of the season, even though it's not really different to what it was at the start of the season, you know. Even if he, you know, I think he's got to stick with it. You know, even if he's, he's got to stick with it because he tinkered a lot. There was a bit of injury there here and there, suspensions, not many at the start of the season, obviously, but certainly injury uh, and all those different things. But know your best 11, start strong, and then go from there. That's what he needs to do. And, and, and that's what we felt that we really hindered come the last two seasons where he's had a full year is we started slow, we started poorly, and then we've had to play catch up for the season. And then we did end up getting there. But we could have done much better and we wouldn't even have to think about the playoff semi-final finals because we already maybe could have even think about automatic promotion if we'd done better early on. If we'd got those points that we definitely shouldn't have dropped early in the campaign. And that's what I mean about knowing your best team. That's why Carl Robinson, I think, a little bit is, I think there is a sense of tactical and managerial inexperience there a little bit because he is a young manager for his age. How I think he's a good manager, but there are things like all managers where he does need to improve. For Carl Robinson, I think there's a long time for him to improve, but knowing your best team, getting those players in early, do that this summer, bring the players you need to do because we know the gaps. Bring them in early on, get your best team going and then go from there. That's what Carl Robinson needs to do. That's what Oxford United needs to do this summer and I hope we can do that. Now, we've had uh, we've had some changes in terms of um, players 
um, you know, leaving already the club. We know the retain list. We know that uh, Lofthouse and uh, Chambers Powerlin, they've been offered contract. They've been the first, they offered their first professional contract. Congratulations to them. We believe Spazov, he's, keep, he's staying at the club as well. We think Rob Hall, at the moment, it, he will not be offered a new contract. However, uh, if no bids are, uh, no offers uh, are coming in for him, he will uh, leave the club to go to that offer. At the moment, he is free, he is available. However, they said they will review the situation if no offers come in. I cannot see Rob Hall not get any offers because I think because uh, I think Rob is a, a really, really good player. Not at League One level, I don't think, in the, you know, anymore. He could maybe with a bit of game time get there, but right now he's not League One level. Um, how old is he exactly? I've got him here. I think I want to say he's probably 27. Yeah, he's 27. Um, yeah, you know, he's 27 years old. So, you know, he is still, you know, he's he's he's, he's peaking. He needs to be playing. He needs to be playing minutes. He needs to be playing, uh, playing football week in week out. And by doing that, I think we will see a better a better Rob Hall. We know what he can do. He's been fantastic for us. Uh, you know, since he's been at Oxford United, we know the, the the quality he's got. He needs to be playing football week in week out. And it is looking like he will leave the club. Other players as well. It looks like um, it looks like Fabio Lopez will be leaving, and it looks like Jack Stevens, obviously not the goalkeeper, but the striker, will be leaving as well. And also looks like the song guy from MK Dons uh, in the summer will also be leaving the club. So really, no disrespect to the other players. I can't remember exactly their name. There's one also with Jack Stevens as well. I can't remember. I think, I think it might be. I think I don't exactly. No, I'm not going to say because I don't exactly know for sure. But majority of players there that will be leaving the club. Again, Rob Paul might not, but I can't see him. You know, I can't see him not uh, get getting offers again. We know what sort of, you know the quality Rob Paul's done. I, I think we should thank him for the fantastic, uh, the, what a fantastic servant he's been to his football club. And what he means to Oxford United, the the highs that he's been with us. Uh, you know, as, as a player, the lows as well. But as a high, generally, he's been a very, very fantastic uh, and incredible servant to his football club. And I do thank him, as long with I'm sure all the other Oxford United fans, we thank him for what he's done. I talk about the goal with Swindon, probably the biggest, the, the, one of the biggest things he's done for Oxford United that fantastic goal even in, in recent very recent times when he got, got that goal um, against Sunderland in the, in the Carabao Cup run that we went on you know that they're the moments as well where Rob Horse showed his quality even earlier in the season uh, with against Watford I thought again you know he was very very good there but that's the position that we're in with the players that are really leaving. We're also hearing that Rob Atkinson is getting some serious interest uh, from Bristol City, Championship Club Bristol City. So, again, be interested to see what happens there. And also, Josh Ruffles, that's the player I was thinking of that I, I knew was a big name, but I wasn't going to say it. But it is. Uh, I can now remember. It reminded me very, very well now. Now I've seen his face on my screen. Josh Ruffles has been offered a contract. He's been offered a contract. He's been on the table for quite a long time this season. However, he has not made his decision as of yet if he is going to sign it. That worries me. I'm not going to lie. Anyway, I want to sort of round up what we've said so far, then move on to sort of the awards I'm going to be giving, and then also looking at the squad we've got now, who we're going to be, who I think we'll keep, who I think should go, not because I don't think they're good enough necessarily, but I think for them as, as a personal, uh, on, on a personal footballing level, who do I think is best for them, what I think is best for the club, and what I think best for the player as well. So we will come on to that. But Let's talk about the. Let's sort of round up what we've said so far. We've so we've we've spoken about how the season has ups and downs. That great run, the start that was very very poor, and where we finished. I think we've we've mentioned that very very well, quite a lot in good detail. Um, the situation with Carl Robinson, he's still got a lot to learn. Do I think he's the right man for the job? I do. I can understand why people maybe think there isn't, but let's be honest, he's been here two years. He's finished in the playoffs twice. Next year's a big year for him, though. He's on a massive contract, like I've already said at the start of the season. A five-year deal for, you know, for... Um a five-year deal uh, for a manager in this league, uh, you know, is very, very big and, and does have a lot of importance. So, um, and, and can it's he's quite rare to be fair, to sign, sign a contract as big as five years. So that's something that's got to be looked at. It might be four actually, four is it four or five? I don't exactly know. But either way, it's a massive contract for a for a manager at this level. But he's still got a lot to learn. Do I think he's the right man for the job? Yes, I think he is the right man for the job. He's a young manager learning. Some people don't like him. I'm not going to change your opinion on that. We all, it's, you know. It's, Football is based on opinion. It's based on what you think. Uh, I'm not trying to change what you think. You might think there's been an extremely successful season. Let's get a party. Uh, you know, let's let, let's start organising a party. For me, I don't think it is at that sense yet because I have high expectations. I think as Oxford United fans, we do have high expectations. We want to be playing in the Championship. It's not going to be. It wasn't last season. It's not this season. But can it be next year? And Corbinson, I think, is going to be key to that. We've also mentioned as well the potential uh, the contract situation at the moment. We've released our retain list, uh, and which players we're going to be releasing and. 
letting go. Rob Hall, the big name there, and Josh Ruffles yet to sign a contract. That's all the situation we, we've mentioned there as well. Also, um, I would say sort of round up on the playoff situation is next year it, we need to learn from the, the playoff disasters uh, against Wickham. I say it's more of a disaster. But that was that was a horrible way to be, to be knocked out. That was a horrible position that we were in to lose that game. I don't think it was necessarily a disaster. I think that Blackpool first leg was very very bad uh, and a very very poor performance and an awful result. I mean, class is disaster though, um, and, and we need to learn from that if we are to do that again. And I think those two different semi final final defeats is it progress? If you're looking at league position and finishing the season, you could say no, but let's look at that. Let's review that next season. Give Carlton this summer. Give him the backing that he needs, and, and that could happen with the takeover. We'll get into that. I think that's where we are now. Hopefully, we're on the right track. Again, there's not many notes to this. There's not much structure to this podcast episode. I'm sort of just going with the flow. I've got a little structure in my head. I've got going through the season, manager, who's who's staying, who's leaving, and then now we're going to be looking at... We'll look at the awards now, uh, and then we'll also be looking at the players maybe leaving. Uh, we mean sold, obviously, because we know the players that have been released, but sold, um, and maybe some players that we're looking to bring in as well. Maybe not individuals, but positions as well. Let's get straight into it. So, this is the current Oxford United squad. Uh, it is actually in position order, which is very, very helpful. So, we've got Simon Eastwood and Jack Stevens as goalkeepers, both of them definitely uh, should stay and we'll sort of go through it we'll do our awards as we go through it if I'd name if, if a player I think gets an award that I'd be giving them um, again this is very much opinion based um, I will say it as it goes so Jack Stevens for me I think he deserves the award I know he actually got young player of the year for Oxford United I think he's probably up there with a the candidate of player of the year I wouldn't give him player of the year because he did didn't play that he hasn't played the whole year but when he has come in he's been absolutely phenomenal and he's a young lad you know he's a young goalkeeper he's 23 um he is old he is a young goal I'm not I'm not quite sure when that young comes young player comes into it is it 23 is that as old as you can be because 23 isn't what well, is young obviously it is young but you know it isn't your 19 your teenagers but I'm guessing I'm, I think 23 24 I'm guessing is when when that threshold of, of young player uh maybe goes but for me Jack Stevens he deserves that award I would give him that award I think he's been very very good uh, and then Jack's and then Simon Eastwood as well difficult position that, that Simon Eastwood was in he has signed that contract he is staying at the football club and for him as well you know I I, I still rate Simon Eastwood you don't turn a bad, bad goalkeeper overnight he had a dodgy spell sort of that playoff uh, final last year definitely probably did hinder his confidence you can clearly see that but generally like I said you don't turn a bad goalkeeper over a night there's still a very very good keeper in there and at what 31 32 31 years old yeah um, you know he's still there and still a very very good keeper and he's not even at you know he's, he's not he's not even thinking about retirement or anything like that at 31 you're probably going to what 36 37 years old for a goalkeeper um, maybe a little bit younger than that but generally around that sort of region he's still got a lot to give so yeah interesting stuff there for Simon Eastwood wouldn't give an award though I don't know. I don't think he deserves an award. I, 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 don't, I don't think we can go to that level. But those two goalkeepers there, they'll both be staying. I hope Jack Stevens will probably get. Um will probably get um, quite a lot of, of interest, but hopefully he does stay. And like I said, he'll be getting the award there. But uh, Simon Eastwood, I don't think he's going to get an award. I think he'll probably understand as to why that is. But he needs to be getting game time in the Cups next season uh, and, and, and impressing himself and pushing Jack Stevens. That's why I'd say as well, I think Jack Stevens has been successful because Simon Eastwood has pushed him as a goalkeeper. Uh, and there's another player as well. I'm you know, remembering as we go, John Messina was the final player to be offered a contract. Now that 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 that's quite strange actually, and I will sort of talk about this this thing with John Messina. Uh, it it looks to be a player contract, which frustrates me a little bit, um, because he doesn't does. I don't think he's he should be given a player contract. Was he 35 now? I don't think a player contract is right for John Messina, um, because. He's a, he's a coach. He's a coach now. I think he's a coach now. I, th I think he's, a, he's someone that's very, very close to Carl Robinson on that touchdown. I think he's a player, I think he's a player that now is sort of working into the, the regions of coaching, getting into the coaching side of the game. Um, he, I don't think he can be the player, uh, given a player contract. Now, of course, he has been nominated for that, for something that I don't actually know the name for. I've completely forgotten the name of it. I'll try and find out for, for it now uh, so I can get it right. And it is significant. I may be thinking there's something to do with... Um, Maybe there was something to do with him because he's part of this. Um, he has to be given uh, this, you know, has to be given this contract. 
uh, as a player because he's been given this um, this role uh, for the league. It's for the whole league, isn't it? So maybe there's something in that. But for me, I don't think he needs to be getting a player contract. He's 35 years old and it does baffle me as to why you'd give him that contract. Can't you give him a, a coach contract? We've just found out as well that as it Craig Short, keep making the Short brothers mixed up, is Craig Short um, is leaving the club. Um as a coach uh, to go close to his home in York. So he's leaving the club. So surely that does free up a coaching slot. I know he's not an out and out coach and he's a fitness coach and there will be people, you know, he will come in as a, as a fitness coach. Um, so, you know, is there not a coaching position we can do something there? Uh, can we not maybe get rid of another coach we've already got and then, you know, transfer him into, you know, transfer and bring in a fitness coach? We've not, you know, I don't think John Messina is, is right to be a fitness coach by any stretch. You need to get an actual sports specialist, sports science specialist in for that role. I'm not saying that, but, you know, is there something we can do there? Um, but yeah, John Messina given a full contract does surprise me a little bit. Um, I'm looking at the comments here. Um, get most of it, no shocks really, but don't understand Messina as a player. That's the position I was in here. That's one of the comments that were actually on the article. Surely this would free up wages for getting players in, would keep Messina in a coaching capacity unless it's expected we lose Atkinson. Even if we lose Atkinson, I don't think John Messina should be the player to come in uh, and, and sort of be, take that, that centre-back spot because John Messino certainly shouldn't be anywhere near that back four, uh, sort of the back, the, the, the back two where we are now. We look at McNally. There's other centre-backs out there, like McNally, like Atkinson, that we've brought in that can do a very, very good job. We haven't seen McNally yet. From what we know, it's to be a very, very good, uh, really, really good centre-half. We're excited to see more of him. But Messina as a player really does surprise me. Um, some other comments here from the article. Mainly it is just the fact that uh, Messino is is being given that contract. Some of his that's right. It's just uh, retain the bulk of the squad and hope for but hope for the best next season and the season after season after. Hope but hopefully, uh, you know, Carmerson will make it happen. Uh, best of luck to Rob Hall for the future. Max Power has been released. Has he? Has he been released? Let's have a look. Has he actually? Been? He he has been released. Max Power actually has been released at twenty seven years old. Um, that surprises me. I didn't even know Max Power had been released by Sunderland. And I'm not being funny. I, I, that's maybe something that we could we could look at. I wouldn't mind having Max Power join the club. I don't know whether or not there's maybe something there um, we could look. at. I'm sure I'll get some some stick from from Oxford United fans in saying that. But I don't like. I don't mind the look of of um, of Max Power. He's a very very good midfielder. A very very good captain as well. So I'm, I'm surprised he's been released by Sunderland. Probably something gone there that we don't quite know about. But yeah, Max Power has been released by Sunderland. It's not even what we're looking for. But yeah, uh, what we and John Messina. The reason why he left um, was because he's taken on a role for the whole league. Maybe that's something there that could be done in having to him taking on that player role. Um, I wouldn't give him that player role though. I would have given him a coaching role. Maybe there's something there. I don't know. Either way though, um, Sam Long, um, he's been signed a contract as well. He's not going anywhere. Josh Ruffles does worry me a little bit. And going back to Sam Long, he would be my player of the year. Um, no doubt there. John, Josh Ruffles, he needs to sign that contract. We do. We really need him to sign that contract. Uh, Luke McNally as well. Um, you know, excited to see more of him or any of him. We haven't seen him this season. Elliot Moore, we will probably keep hold of him. I would keep hold of him. Rob Atkinson, lots of rumours maybe seeing him leave the club. Hopefully we can keep hold of him. He's a great player. Joe Grayson will be going back to Blackburn. We'll go back to Blackburn because he's not going to Blackpool. At Blackburn, he'll probably be signing for another club permanently because Blackburn, uh, I think, have let him go and we're not going to be renewing that loan uh, You know that loan deal. Uh, wouldn't Probably wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if you could see him go to Fleetwood with his dad, to be honest. Uh, Jamie Hansen looks like he's going to stay. I don't know quite know how long he's got left in his contract. So I think Jamie Hansen's got a future Oxford United. Um, yes and no. Um, yes and no, I'd say. I think he's a player that is, is clearly very, very injury prone. We've seen that this season. I don't think he's there quite yet. Do I know what, best, what his best position is? No. Probably right back, probably right back, but I don't. We haven't seen enough of him there, and I don't think you know he's John, Sam Long's be letting that position go up for go up for position, uh, of, you know, for another player to come in and, and take it, you know, make get it up for grabs really. So yeah, I think I think that's going to be interesting from position from from Jamie Hansen. Um, yeah, um, Alex Gorin. Keep hold of him. Obviously, keep hold of Alex Gorin. Anthony Ford, probably keep hold of him. Elliot Lee's going back to Luton. I wouldn't mind seeing him come back. He was very, very good. Mark Sykes, the same. Liam Kelly, we've already mentioned him already today. 
Uh, Liam Kelly's an interesting one. Probably will see him go back to Fennel. Cameron Brannigan, can we keep hold of him? Hopefully. Marcus McGuane will sign permanently. Rob Hawes left. Uh, James Henry as well. Um, I don't quite know what his future is in terms of playing, how much game, how much football he's going to be getting played because I think at times you do see him you know, show his age a little bit, even at what, 31 he is. You do sort of see him sometimes show his age. But again, he's clearly no, no doubt there's a quality player there. Brandon Barker probably going back to Rangers. We could see something, a deal there potentially uh, coming back. Shadipo, again, the same. Matty Taylor, obviously, will be keeping him. Dunaji, hopefully, we can keep him. I think he's got a lot more to give. And same with Sam Winnell there as well. He won't be going anywhere uh, again. So... In terms of that, we've sort of done a few awards in there as well. In terms of my best player, I think it's between Rob Atkinson and Sam Long. I'd probably edge towards Sam Long. Uh, it's Jack Stevens, Young Player of the Year, 100%. Signing of the season's an interesting one. Um, I didn't. I, I generally haven't looked at that really. So honestly, I think it's probably, probably between uh, Brandon Barker and... You'd probably say Matty Taylor, to be honest, because Matty Taylor obviously signed permanently, and I know we had him last season, but he's been very, very good this year. A lot of goals being scored. Brandon Barker as well. He hasn't been, I don't think, as amazing as we first thought he was. I think he had a little bit of inconsistency uh, when he joined, but generally you can see the talent there. He's an absolutely fantastic player. Um, yeah, there's a few options, isn't there? There's a few options. Elliot Lees, like I said, was good. Rob Atkinson, if you count him, uh, obviously he joined in January, so he f feels like a new signing, but he's obviously not. He was there last year, but a great player in that sense. Um, yeah, interesting to see what, what you know what, what we see from there. But there, that's the squad. That's who I think I'd lead. Who, who maybe we could look to bring, you know, offload. Who where we need to bring in? It's very simple. I'd say a left back, maybe even two left backs if Josh Ruffles leaves. Um, I think in that midfield we need a bit more physicality. We need to be a little bit more. We need a max power, and hopefully we do that. I don't know if there's any rumours. What you know, what's going on? Um, why, you know, why is is Max Power leaving the club? Uh, because he looked like a very, very good, uh, very, very good player. Max Power, Sunderland captain among seven reads. I know this is a comp Chris Maguire has also been. Chris Maguire's gone as well. Um, I know, obviously, they didn't go up, so um, you know that that was something to do with it. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. Sunderland really getting rid of some players. I know, uh, I, I you know, I know Max Power isn't a favourite around Oxford United in terms of what he did earlier in the season. But I think as a player, he's very talented. He's a great player. I would not mind seeing a player like Max Power staying at the club. Even Chris Maguire coming back. How old is Chris Maguire? I know Max Power's only twenty-seven. That's the player we need. That's the physicality we need. And clearly, Sunderland are ruthless. They are being ruthless in terms of letting players go. How old is Chris Chris Maguire now? Is he probably thirty? Is he 30 yet? 32, yeah. He, you know, he is over 30. But again, he's, you know, he's still, what is it? Five goals a season, five assists in, in 12 starts. It's not awful, is it? And at 32, he's getting on a little bit. So we don't really know where, where we'd see him go. But in terms of Max Power, 27 years old, I think he's sort of the position player we need in that midfield. A bit more physicality. And I like the way that we're going with McGuane. He's the sort of player that we need to go down that sort of road. That's the route we need to go down with, uh, with him, uh, for sure. Um, and in terms of going forward as well, I think we do need a little bit more of a, a physical number nine. We've got Sam Winnell, great finisher. Matty Taylor, great finisher. But someone that's... Phys I think Dan Adji's there, but a little bit like Dan Adji. And I think that's why Dan Adji's very, very good in this league at times. And when he comes on, you sort of see that sort of spark of brilliance because he's physical. Um, and we need a bit more physicality in there. Um, you know, especially going forward in defence and, and, and in that midfield. Like I said, left back certainly an option we need to look at. Maybe centre back, but then it looks like John Messina has been offered a contract. If he is actually being in plans to to give us that depth at centre back, maybe we're not looking at a centre half, which is interesting. Right back, maybe. But if we keep handsome, we probably won't look at a right back. Sam Long will be our main number, you know, main main right back. Sean Clare, when he comes back, I'm not quite sure where he will go. Um, you know, you know that, that that's something very, very interesting. So we'll see what happens there. So that's pretty much all things covered, Oxford United, this season, isn't it? We've sort of gone through everything. We've seen the ups, the downs. We've gone through the results, if you like, the key moments of this campaign. We've looked at every single player there, future at the football club, looking at potential rumours of players leaving the club, positions we definitely need to strengthen this summer. It's a big summer for Carl Robinson. We've spoken about Carl Robinson as well. His future as an Oxford United manager. Is Carl Robinson the right man for the job? Job. Is he the right coach to take Oxford United to the level we want to bring Oxford to? That's definitely something that we've done, that we have discussed today. So please make sure you leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Give your thoughts on this season down there as well. Other than that, I've been Jack. This has been the Young Fan Podcast. So much European Championship content coming your way as well. Um, so excited for that. This is sort of the roundup 
finished Ox United's campaign, summarised all in one podcast episode, quite a long one of course, but please do subscribe and leave a like if you enjoyed both of those things. I've been Jack, this has been the Unfine Podcast and I'll see you in a bit.